I'm really excited to introduce Chaku. We had first met when I was 17 years old, I think, and a member of the Youth Advisory Council to the Office of Mental Health. And he came in with a ponytail, <laughs> and he was saying how he started as a youth leader and how meaningful it was that we were there influencing change. And he continues to say things like that to me, being a real source of empowerment and enlightenment, really helping me to understand the, the history that came before our current youth movement, and really taking those lessons learned and applying them. He's very well known across the, the peer movement in both mental health and addiction services, and right now he is the um, director of the NAMI Star Center, which offers national technical assistance on youth leadership and development as an essential strategy for systems transformation. And Youth Power is a part of our national advisory group for that, really helping to, us to connect to other youth groups across the country and share our expertise and learn from the things that they're doing. So Chaku is really a source of, of collaboration and inspiration for many of us in the movement, and I'm very pleased to welcome him to wow. us. Thank you. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Stephanie. I remember that day being in the uh, youth advisory meeting room, and I remember walking in wondering what it is that I could possibly say that would make any kind of difference. And it's always been the same thing, just my own experience, our own experience. And uh, wow, did I learn a lot in that room all right from the beginning. So in other words, and, and then be quiet, actually. Share a little bit, and then listen. And um, I've learned from Stephanie ever since. And so you know, when we were doing our first project proposal for the Star Center to you know, go for the grant that would actually provide national technical assistance on youth leadership, um, I asked Stephanie right away for her advice and, and, and uh, Youth Power's advice around what we really needed. So to, become, to get a chance to come back to you here um, at Families Together in New York State is just such an incredible honor. So thank you, Paige, uh, it just, and all of you who are involved. The work today, you know, I, I, there's a lot I want to share with you, um, but I wanted to emphasize something just right from the get, which is that the preparation you have done all of these years uh, to come together and organize as you have um, as an integrated community of family members of young people really putting your voice collectively and creating a home for that collective voice has never been more right on time never been more right on time and if you're like me uh, you feel like maybe you're right on time but you're also feeling like you're almost a little too late <laughs> Like there's something that you missed or there's that you wish you had known about something six months earlier you would have been able, or that you knew you had learned what you knew now six months prior, you know, but actually you are. I got to tell you, you are so right on time. And because I get a chance to see things all across the country, I'm really grateful to how much we have here in New York and how much you've already prepared for yourself. So I'm hoping that what I get to share with you today is a framework or offers you some tools uh, you know, for individuals, for us as individuals, for us as families, for us as communities, as systems, um, and offer a framework for what we do next. How, how do we prepare ourselves to really be in this new environment? How do we be um, honoring of who we are and where we've come from, while at the same time really discover the wings that we need to go forward? So that's a little bit of what I'm thinking about sharing and I'm calling them the tools for thriving you know as a part of what we're referring to there's there you know the recent decades of research on resilience have shown it there's actually probably hundreds of tools I'm just framework providing like a four set you know to keep it simple for you and for me <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes I'd love your feedback about it so Oh, so one more thing just about Star Center, just so you know. So what we, what we are is we're SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration funded grant cycle that actually supports two regions of the country. So regions two and region six. So that's New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Texas. And so those states we get to support um, around organizational sustainability and development, so helping you build your infrastructure specifically for peer and family-run organizations. 
That's you, right? So we'll be hopefully adding to the mix of things that you're already doing, not duplicating, but really hoping to build on you, your expertise and your work, and offer some things like a series for the whole region. You might be able to learn from other states and they might learn from you, for example, on the secrets of sustainability. We have a secrets of sustainability series we're gonna put out um, in this new environment. What does that look like? Um, so if you want to check out some of those things, you can go to our website. It's consumerstar.org. If you're like uh, me, you've already checked me out, <laughs> right? You've gone way ahead. You're already online seeing there. Just subscribe the, to the listserv and you'll get the announcements uh, right away. You can also, of course, we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and uh, YouTube as well. So uh, we were happy to feature Youth Power recently in our newsletter and all of the great resources you're putting together, Stephanie, on Youth Power YouTube videos. So thank you for that. All right, so I think the best way for me to start is by telling you a story, I'm thinking, right? So a story that's actually been very important to me. Um, it's one of my favorite stories from an old epic poem called the Ramayana. It's an epic poem of India. So here it is. So the Vanaras were a shape-shifting people. They had the powerful qualities of monkeys and bears. And they were on a mission to find a princess who had been kidnapped. And they had just discovered that she was held captive on an island across the sea. So they were overjoyed because they were looking for her for such a long time all over the world. And now that they found her, knew where, at least knew where she was, she seemed only a step away from rescue. So they rushed down to the shores and with shouts of joy, they looked out across the sea and suddenly fell silent. Their hope turned to despair because as they looked out across the ocean, they realized just how far they really had to go. Their leader gathered them together, offered a few encouraging words, and said, how far can each of you jump? And they all started answering the question. Hanuman, the greatest warrior of the Vanaras, sat way in the back alone, quiet, and dejected. His uncle, Jambavan, saw him and went over and said, Hanuman, what are you doing way back here, silent and dejected, all by yourself? He said, don't you know who you are? And he started reminding Hanuman who he was. He started telling Hanuman stories about himself and his family. He said, Hanuman, when you were just a child, you saw the sun rising up in the sky, and you thought it was an apple, so you leaped up to go get it. That was many times more. You nearly plucked it right out of the sky. That was many times more the distance of this ocean. As Hanuman heard his uncle speaking about himself and his family and all the stories, he started to feel the strength returning to him. His muscles started to grow. He even got bigger. You know? When his leg twitched as he remembered that first jump, he remembered. So he stood up, shook himself like a lion, and with a deep growl, prepared to cross the sea. So this is just a small part of that story, which actually takes about a year to tell from start to finish. You know? <laughs> so and my daughter, who is now seven, has heard it already three times. You know? <laughs> so these stories, you know, like, you know, in myth, in some cultures, it's either real or not real, or, you know, true or not true. Um, a friend of mine recently was reflecting on myth, uh, and she was kind of recognizing something that, you know, has been written about for a long time, which is that, you know, myth actually, when we really think about what it means for us, uh, these are things that are true that happen over and over and over again, aren't they? And in this story, the reason this story was so important to me was that it shows for me just how important it was the role of family in remembering, the role of family in connecting with who we are and, who, and what we're about and what's important to us. Remembering, the first tool of thriving. Not just remembering who we are, but also what we want. So that brings us back to this national context of where we are today, you know, sitting here, many centuries later from that story, in an environment where tragically, you know, globally, across the country, every state is under financial, some kind of financial crisis, 
Uh, things like Medicaid spending is running away, you know, the, the two and a half trillion dollar or more healthcare spending a year, one in four fam you know, people in, in families in the country with a person with disability, 90, 85 to 95% unemployment rate among those of us with psychiatric histories, for example. 25 years earlier than everyone else or more, some of us are, most of us are dying, you know, so in terms of those of us with psychiatric and addiction related histories, even further. Um, wow, I can keep going, right? I mean, so when we think about the spending just in New York State alone, we've known this for a while, but that 80% or more of the Medicaid expenditure has been incurred by 20% of the population, and that's those of us with medical, mental health, and addiction-related disorders. And that ability to actually support and address those costs, improve the quality of care, and actually improve health outcomes is something we've been struggling with, and that's where we are today. So I tell these stories hopefully in that context so that we can think about what does it really mean for us with, when we take this tool of thriving, tool of remembering, what, is it, what does that mean today? So I want you to think about that. I'm not going to tell you right away what I think, but I want you to think about that too. So the other stake I want to mention is that the stake for those of us who are people of color. So, Indians, like me, I'm born in Kuwait, and my family immigrated from India. Um, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino, Native American, LGBTQ, criminal justice involved, all of these communities, impacted communities, have very unequal standards of care that we've been able to access, not only access, but also improve our health outcomes. So, uh, New York State alone, three to four times uh, the rate of everyone else, African Americans are hospitalized, right? And uh, the, um, the diabetes is a higher, and cardiovascular illness, things like that are all higher. And we have to address some of these issues. So I tell that, I say that because for me personally, remembering is a key quality because of something that I learned. Somebody asked me, tell me when you were happiest. And this was at a time where I was struggling. I was at my worst. I never thought I'd be in such a difficult place. And somebody's asking me to remember when I was happiest. And so I struggled with that. And finally, I remember I had a memory of a time when I sat on this elephant when I was in India. I was only six years old. I returned, my family was returning to India. And I was on this big elephant. And, and where we're from in India, it's South India, where they clear, used elephants at the time to clear some land for farming. We were a farming village. And this elephant, they let me rise up on the elephant. And as I sat on this elephant, man, I felt so connected. I felt like I belonged to this elephant. As I, I remembered, I immediately connected to what it was like to walk through the, through the fields, you know, the sugarcane fields and, and all of the different areas of that, of that village. And I felt like my uncles and my aunts and my cousins, they all looked at me as though I belonged. They looked at me like I had something to contribute. They had a confidence about me that I didn't even have yet about myself. I re suddenly remembered all of these things sitting on that elephant. And I remembered that when I started to reflect on it. But I want to tell you why I remember that so clearly. Because I wasn't feeling that way here in the States. When my family came to the States, what we remember and what I remembered was seeing the hostility that my family dealt with. Um, we moved from New York City up to Rochester, New York. This was 1972 and 73. We started in the Bronx, the, in you know, Queens, in these areas. The Bronx was literally burning, you know, in the 70s. And then we came upstate, and we thought it would be a little different. People said there were jobs. Well, it turned out jobs were only going to people who were not people of color, who were the, only to the white people in the community. And there was a big challenge going on at that time. And that Saul Alinsky came to the city and was helping people of color actually take employment back in Rochester. And apparently, when this actually happened, it actually transitioned as we arrived in 72 and 73 in Rochester, 74 in Rochester, New York. But the issue was people were unhappy about it. So the hostility was more. You know what I mean? So we were getting all kinds of stuff. And I didn't really realize, and I'm only four or five years old, I'm, I don't know this context that I'm describing you to today, but I did know in certain moments. I knew, for example, when my father and I were walking down the street 
and his hand would squeeze. That was his signal. When my father's hand squeezed a little tighter, that meant stay with him, he's going to walk a little faster. And as we walked by, whoever it was, you know, I could see him settle down a little bit and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd be calmer. And I'd look back to see who it was or what they were doing and sometimes they were laughing, sometimes they were pointing, sometimes they had angry faces. I saw authorities treating my family, even on that trip, uh, uh, making fun of the way we talked, the way we dressed, our accents, our clothes, you know. Um, so the, the, the in feeling inside of me was, what's going to happen to me? When is it going to be me, me next? How, when's my turn? Because I would watch my father try to keep his cool and keep me safe. Well, at the same time, I didn't know how I was going to handle it. I didn't think I could keep that cool. I didn't think that I could handle these indignities this way. So when I started school, I started experiencing it, and so I handled it my own way. It turned out that wasn't the way the school liked. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, they didn't uh, see my passion or my uh, frustration you know, in the way that I did. They didn't hear it. So slowly, over time, you know, that school didn't work out, and another school didn't work out, and then we found some accommodations where uh, my family's needs might get met. But we struggled with this for years. And then just to fast forward a little bit, my, you know, my sense of safety started reducing dramatically. I didn't feel like anybody could keep me safe. In my own school, in my own home, in my own uh, environment, my own community, the sidewalk rejected me. You know? So I was going to have to have my own back. I was going to have to take care of my own protection. Um, so what that meant was even my family couldn't be trusted. And so that's what I started to to wonder. Maybe they were sick of me. Maybe they didn't want me anymore. Maybe they, and I started to look for and find evidence of that in their discussions at night, um, in their angry, upset moments, you know, with me. I started to incorporate all that. They were, they were actually very loving. Every, every, there's not one moment I can guarantee you that my parents dropped their love for me, but I could never feel it. I started to wonder if they were poisoning my food, and I started being convinced of it, and I stopped eating our food. And I stopped trusting even people who are associated with them. So this sense of isolation continued. And I tried to feel better by using drugs. I tried to feel better by getting involved in fights. I tried to feel better by getting with a new crowd. I tried to feel better by not being Indian anymore. Uh, for a whole year, I was Puerto Ricano in this one particular area. Any Puerto Ricanos here? Proud Puerto Ricano? No? Not yet? OK, good. So I, I, I I changed my identity. I tried so many things. All the ways I tried to soothe myself from these traumas, you know, never worked. They, we call them almost working tools, you know. These are the tools that almost worked. We turned to them all the time. I was soothing myself with fire, and I didn't know I could just step out. It didn't feel like I ever could. So I tried to kill myself at 15, and, you know, my father, and my mother, they didn't, you know, we were Indian. We didn't reach out to a lot of people during this time. We didn't want to tell people what was going on. We were the first ones to come to this country to, you know, to be an experiment, if you will, for the rest of my family. We wanted to have people come and learn how to, how to be here. And my father, you know, I'm there, and he turns to another man finally in a, in a, in a church. And he says to him, he says, you know, my son's in the hospital. He just tried to kill himself. He's on drugs. I don't know what to do. And this other man said, said two words that changed the course of my family's history. He said, me too. Me too. His son was going through a similar struggle. He was going to, he just said he's going to introduce my father to other families who are organizing that area to share their stories and support each other. And guess what? Also support their children and their young people in that community to start what they had uh, first envisioned would be a, a center, a, a little recovery center to support the students in that particular school. And so they, gave, they renovated an old horse barn, threw a bunch of uh, couches and ping pong tables and pool tables, and there was a soda machine. That was apparently our revenue source. And uh, these, this place became a place where I went before school, after school, evenings, weekends, holidays and I connected with other students. I went there thinking that I would always have to have my backup 
They didn't look like me, talk like me, sound like me, anything like me, you know? Like Stephanie said, I had hair down to my waist, like way over my uh, eyes. You couldn't see me unless you kind of pulled it apart, you know? I was 100 pounds soaking wet, same height as I am today, really struggling, you know? And when the way they looked at me was the way I remembered that look. It was back on that elephant. Got to drop my guard for the first time in a long time. Never thought I'd feel that. So when I dropped my guard, it was a, it was a risk. that I, I'd taken a lot of risks. Michael Nerney probably told you about that yesterday, right? So this was one of those risks that I, even with that other experience, I could still, from seeking safety quite, quite quickly to taking risks. Guess what? Tool for thriving number two. Risk taking. First one is remembering. Second is risk taking. So in that process of that my, fa my father and my mother discovered that the system wasn't quite on the same page with what we wanted. Remembering what we wanted and taking the risk to voice that became so important. The system was just happy I wasn't fighting anymore. The system was just happy that I wasn't trying to kill myself or anyone else anymore. They said, just be cool, let him smoke, let him do all this, other, you know, whatever it is, don't worry about it, he'll be okay. And my parents said, well, what about school? What about work? How's he going to survive in this community? How's, you know, who's he going to become? We're not helping him with any of those things. So their eyes were on a different prize, right? And so they didn't forget that, just like you're not forgetting that. And so they kept that prize alive in, in front of them every moment, and even though I still didn't trust them. It took a long time for me to connect with my family and reunify and reconnect. Man, that process was something we had to do at that moment. So I tell you this story for a number of reasons, but those are kind of the first two that I wanted to emphasize, the remembering and the risk-taking of that moment and the chance that we took to really bring ourselves together and the work that you're doing here and just to relate to you a little bit, you know, about that. So I want to... Say and tell you another story. I hope you don't mind all these stories. They're, they're important to me. You know, this one story that I thought of that I thought would, you would enjoy uh, was more, is more recent. It was only a few years ago, and it was um, in my family. Maybe you know. There, by the way, I'm I'm eating my family's food now, so I can tell you that story another time. But they're so because of that, they're so happy to feed me any time I show up, right? So my favorite foods are all laid out on a buffet anytime I show up. And when somebody from India or a family elder comes, it's even more so, right? So one, one uncle of mine, he's a, Chaku is short for Chakapurukal. Chakapurukal, can, can you all say that? Ready? <laughs> so Chakapurukal, it, it's kind of a house name. There's uh, those of us with that house name and you know, the Chakapurukal house. This one man is the other Chakapurukal. He came to America to visit he and his wife, and so everybody's laid out this great food on a buffet, and I'm in line, he and I are in line together eating first, and everybody, like 30 people are waiting for us to get our plates. And he's getting his plate, and his is piled up like this, you know, and, uh, and he, he looks back at my plate, which is very selective, I have a few things. I love all the food that they put out, but I'm not eating it all, and he turns to me, he says, what are you, he's actually scolding me, he's like, what are you doing? You're supposed to eat all the food that gets put out. They're doing this for us, you know? What do you, you know, why wouldn't you eat this food? And I said, oh, you know, Apachin, the fact is that I'm the last, one of the last men over 40 in our family that doesn't have diabetes. I'd like to keep it that way. <laughs> you know? My father taught me that, you know? Ever since he became diabetic, he started testing my blood sugar and making sure I knew how to do that. And this man that I'm talking about, this uncle, He's a, a doctor, he's a gynecologist, his wife's a cardiologist, very educated people, you know, they're, you know uh, doing well in India, where we're from. And he, so he, what he said to me surprised me, shocked me, in fact. I almost didn't know what to say afterwards. He said, oh, Chakumon, you're going to get it. We're all going to get it. There's no escaping it. We're going to get diabetes. You might as well eat. Wow. Oh my God. In fact, because apparently there's a look in my eye that everyone notices in the family now, and they're all like, uh oh, put the table, because I used to flip tables, you know, they'd keep the tables down, you know? <laughs> and so that look must have look, been looking in my eye because it got quiet. Everybody stopped talking for a minute. And uh, 
they were wondering what I was going to say to them. And I said, oh, you know, well, actually, you know, in my, because I took a deep breath and I realized that where he was coming from, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I explained to him, I said, look around here, Nidun, Naveen, I had named a bunch of my family members. They were all pre-diabetic and prevented it because we actually recognized it ahead of time as children and as adults, and we started doing something about it, all right? Uh, he hadn't seen that before. The reason he hadn't seen that before is because Kerala, where I'm from, the state of India, where I'm from, is actually diabetes capital of the world. We have the highest prevalence in the world, um, lar largely because of what we eat, you know, uh, the kinds of foods we eat. And so, uh, and the pace at which we eat it and the quantities <laughs> you know, and all of those things, right? There's a lot of it. But um, my favorite foods are the, what, the foods that would cause me the most difficulty. And so he hasn't even, he hasn't even known anyone to prevent this. So that's where he was coming from. His experience was, this isn't possible. This ex his experience was, everybody gets it, even as a doctor. So I needed to recognize that. But I didn't need to avoid my truth either, right? And explain what was happening in this part of our family and that things were changing. So there are four measures that I want to tell you about. It just so happens about a decade or more ago, Judith Hibbard and the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation started researching something called health activation measures. If you're familiar with them, great. I'm going to give you a quick overview. There are four of them. The first one is something that my uncle didn't have around his health activation. Health activation means actually you know, doing things and proceeding around things that are important to our health, right? So first one was to have a belief that you can actually do something or change something about your own health. So in other words, my, my uncle didn't believe he could actually change anything about his diabetes. Now, I've experienced that learned helplessness about my circumstances before. I thought I could never change who I was. And I thought I would always be a certain way. I thought I'd always do certain things. I always thought I'd be involved in certain self-destructive behaviors and habits. I thought I'd always be taking the wrong risks, right, in everybody else's eyes, things like that. So I, I know something about that. That's the first measure. The second measure I thought was really interesting is this measure of having knowledge and confidence about, about the kind of change. So do, what do, I, do I know what to eat differently? Do I have confidence that I could find a way to eat differently? The third one is very simple. Do I start eating differently, right? But here's the get. The, fir the fourth one was the one that surprised me the most and I thought was really the most important. And this is where it comes to us as a tool of thriving, something to really consider. The fourth measure is do we do these changes, do we engage these new strategies around our health when we're under stress? Wow. What happens when we're under stress? This is the one that worked. Here's the ones that almost work, but they feel better, don't they? Because they're familiar. They're the ones I always go to. They're the ones I've worked on for 20 years. You know what I mean? Whatever it is. That's, that's, that, that I feel soothed. We call them our comfort foods, maybe. We call them, right? Whatever it might be. It could be the smoking. It could be the sitting. It could be the, it could be the you know, um, the different foods we like to eat. All of those things. So just soothing myself isn't enough anymore. Just feeling safe isn't enough anymore. So this is where some risk taking at that level of thriving starts to come into play. But a third tool is necessary. We call it restoring. Restoring. <laughs> Changing the narrative, rewriting the script. That means believing that who I was before may not be who I really am. Maybe there's a true nature that I am yet to uncover. Maybe there's a true nature to my family that is being still discovered and, and operate, you know, put into, pre, into play here. Uh, maybe there's a true nature to our community, to our, to our movement that we're still discovering. So restoring means getting a chance to rewrite it, saying, well, yeah, that might have been who I was. We used to have a saying, you know, when we did the Peer Bridger Project, we not only help each other get out of the hospital and stay out of the hospital, you can add whatever word, you know, prison, jail, RTFs, whatever, right, in there. Um, but we now support each other to get the hospital out of us. Mm-hmm, yeah. So when I tell that story, I told that story uh, very briefly um, 
uh, one time in a Creedmoor psych psychiatric center, and I was doing a peer support meeting there, and there was a bunch of people you know, in the center, there was a bunch of people on the outside of the circle, and then there was a bunch of people sleeping on the outside of the circle. You know, we never kicked anybody out. We always welcomed them in. And I told that story, and I just kind of said, yeah, you know, we're thinking about this, you know, we're getting the hospital out of us. And as soon as I said that, a chair kind of flew right by me, and a woman got up and said, yeah, now that's what I'm talking about. And she was sleeping. I didn't know she was talking, you know? <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, if you're going to talk about that, I want in. Are you going to talk about that? I said, yeah, she picked up her chair and sat in the center and started to talk about how she'd been carrying messages about herself every time she left the hospital, every time she left the, the system that she was in and tried to make it on her own. Everybody just kept saying, go back, but she knew that wasn't it either. She was trying to figure out, what's the new, what's the new message to myself? Who am I? How do I get this out of me? I know it's not me. I need to be free from it. And so that was what she was discovering. So third tool. The fourth tool is very simple. It's what we've been working on all this time. It's in, it's in this process, just like a, in a waterfall, when you're, it feels like a river knows itself, but then in a waterfall, droplets of water start to come out. And it starts to feel like you're all by yourself. You might be this one droplet of water in this fall. You don't even remember ever being part of a river before. All you feel is that fall. But there's a reconnection, isn't there? There's a moment where that droplet of water becomes part of the river again. That reconnection is what we want. That reconnection is what we're striving for. When, when my family started noticing me showing up for dinner and trying to eat, or, you know, I would always put my head down like this and I would struggle to eat so I wouldn't look at my mom. Because she would always look at me with these, with these eyes while I was eating. I didn't know what that was about. I thought it was uh, something uh, wrong, you know? Now I have a child, I know what that means. Right? She was trying to uh, feel the love of that moment of me eating her food. And here I am struggling with it. And one day, it took many, you know, many years later, maybe 15 years later, I'm 30 years old, sitting with my parents, eating, and I'm going this, and I'm noticing her, I noticed her looking at me, but I'm not feeling what I usually feel. I'm not feeling those kind of words or thoughts or or uh, perceptions that kind of say, get out of there, you know? And it just said, look up. You can look up now. So I looked up, and there's my mom looking at me like she always was. And I felt it. Finally felt it. What she'd been trying to say in that look all these years. I never thought I'd get that. I didn't know how to explain it. She didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. We just both acknowledged it with a little kind of smile in our eyes, and I went back to eating. Dad, he missed the whole thing. <laughs> he was just eating, enjoying everything he said. But man, talk about neuroplasticity in action, right? That was, that was when I realized, wow, this can be rewired. Something that I had been thinking was just I would have to put up with and tolerate the fact that I would just kind of pretend to be reconnected with my family and do, kind of go through the motions, would actually, I would become whole again in a way that I had never th thought possible. So it is possible, and it can be done, because I've done it, you know? I think that the last moment that I really struggled with this um, was every moment. I walked into a room with a person I hadn't met yet, with a family that I hadn't met yet. Every time I thought I'd had the confidence about what my experience had been and what we could do, even our experience, our collective experience, but every family, every individual is a universe of one. So every time their challenge came in my view, I got scared, just like Hanuman did, just like every person does when they see just how far we have to go, right? Every community, every system, every moment, we, we struggle with that. You know, and we suddenly feel like that droplet of water. But man, I got to tell you, every time I do just some of these basics, I remember, I take a risk, I restory, and I reconnect. You know, I just kind of get out of the way a little bit and just see what's going to happen next. And I allow people to emerge in that way. That's, guess what? We show up. We remember who we are. So I'll leave you with one story, one last story. It's very short. A man came to India a long time ago, and he saw, and it's not my story, it's a story from Michael Patton. 
He's a qualitative researcher, but he went, he saw this, this man went to India, saw this strange bird with huge feathers that went up behind him and, and uh, had a strange colored beak and colored, you know, uh, colored, same coloring and everything. It was a peacock, right? Have you ever seen a peacock stretch out like that? He, said, he felt bad for the bird. He said, oh my gosh, this bird's never going to survive. It's a genetic freak. Right? And he started to trim back the feathers, trim the beard back, and even dyed the feathers black. He says, there now, now you'll fit. You're like, more like a standard guinea hen. Yeah. We can relate to that, right? Whether it's as individuals, whether it's cultures, or as communities, even systems. Even right now, you're trying to adapt and become part of a new system, maybe a Medicaid system. You feel like they're trying to trim your feathers back, trim your beak to fit, to be what they might feel more comfortable with, to make sure you're going to survive. We'll, we'll, we'll give you resources and support. Don't worry. We'll help you, we'll help you along the way. All right? Yet, we, is, it no long, is it a peacock anymore? Right? Is it who it was? So this man, I was telling this story in Vancouver, Washington, and this man from Alaska said to me, hey, Chaku, we have a similar story. It goes a little bit differently. I said, oh, yeah, tell it. And he says, OK, well, a man came to Alaska, and he saw a great white bear, and he thought the same thing. He felt, oh, my gosh, this doesn't look like the right thing. We should dye it black. So he went to dye the bear black, and the bear ate him. Hmm. So I'm not sure what that means to you. You know, but it does mean we have to hold some sense of who we are. I don't know if we eat everybody who comes our way. All right, I'm not sure that's the answer. But I do, do think it's time for collaboration. I do think it's time to break our silos. I do think it's time to, to learn how to be part of a broader network. I do think it's time to let go of turf issues. You know, all of those things that we struggle with um, that many of you have actually already walked through of what we're trying to do today. So I hope we continue. Um, that same sidewalk that rejected me is now transformed because of our work together, because of your work here in New York. You know, my family gets to have a different life, a different experience. Anybody struggling like my family did won't have to go through what we went through because of all of you. So thank you so much for involving me with your conference. Thank you for letting me be here. I hope you have a good night.